How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? Uh, you know, I, I'm aspirationally fantastic. <laughs> I would love to get to fantastic at some point, you know? I think it's coming, hopefully. How have you been doing? Been good. It's been a... Uh... It's been a little strange, you know, rolling out a record without doing the normal things that we do, you know, touring or uh, um, a lot of the press kind of stuff has been on the Zoom thing, which is I'm not very good with technology. So it's been difficult for me. I'm always running around trying to find a room that the Internet uh, will let me do this stuff. <laughs> and, the, and the record was kind of postponed because of the COVID, right? It was, yeah. We 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 finished it. Um, I think it, we had like a a wrap dinner at, in like late November, um, and we're prepping and kind of had our finger on the button, ready to go. And then you know everything stopped, uh, which was kind of you know in a way it was you know we felt like we had worked really hard and we were ready to go. But also, it was kind of um, it was kind of nice to be able to relax after making a record for the first time, and um, kind of sit with the you know what we had done, and and um, you know we had we had a chance to go back in and and tweak stuff, but we had worked so hard. I feel like none of us wanted to go back in, and yeah, we're we're proud of the record, and you know a lot of the stuff that's on the record, a lot of people would think that it was written during. Uh, or after this situation, because some of the lyrics kind of were a little foretelling, um, but that wasn't the case. It, it was all it was all pre-pandemic. It's a bit spooky. You're not the first person to say that to me about their music. You know, it's a bit spooky about how much art was made about that that relates so well to the pandemic, and it's made me think. And maybe this is getting a bit deep here, but it's made me think just about why that is. You know what I mean? Like, what is it about? poetry or what is it about the way that we express ourselves that um, we were sort of ready for it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it definitely is something that it's come, it's it's happened before. You know, I've kind of said things in songs that, that come to pass in, in, in ways that maybe I only I would understand. But it got me thinking after this one, I'm like, man, I need to write some songs about just great times and <laughs> everyone's healthy and happy and rich. And, you know, and then maybe that'll happen. But yeah, it, it's definitely uh, something that makes me scratch my head and go, man, that's it's so eerie how, how close it is, you know, hitting home. You, you can you write me a few lottery numbers? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I got you. Four, <laughs> five, seven, 13 and, and 12. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play them tonight. Um, you, you had a chance to sit back and reflect on the record, which is something that almost no one gets to do. You put out a record, you tour, you kind of go crazy, you know, um, promoting it, doing press. It's hard, to, it's hard to reflect on it sometimes till like a decade afterwards, but you got to do it right away. Did you hear something different when you reflected on the record? Well, I, I, I have a hard time listening to myself. So usually after we leave the studio, Unless I uh, hear it on the radio or something like that. I don't really listen. I'm not like rocking Kings of Leon in the house. I don't think my family would be too keen to that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say it was probably four months after we made it before I actually listened to it. My wife, first time she heard it was when she bought it. You know, she would always be like, can I hear the record? I'm like, uh, no, I'm not ready. You know, you know. Um, but yeah, when I did finally listen back, I was it, I was pleased with it. You know, we we put in more time on this album than we ever have. Um, we went in knowing what we wanted to you know come out with, and I feel like we we accomplished that. And so now, for me, as opposed to, I mean, I'm going to have to listen to it a little more so I can remember the songs. Um, but for me, it's always like after the studio door closes behind me, my brain starts thinking about you know what's next. She what bought it? Hell yeah. I mean, she's making half the money anyway. So <laughs> her money. It's going right back into the same pocket, I suppose, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> when she was working with Victoria's Secret, I'd, I bought Victoria's Secret underwear. I mean, come on. Yeah, you're not, you're, not, you're not waiting for comps, I understand. 
that she wasn't happy when she walked in. I was wearing them. Oh my God! But now I have stuff for the next record. Can you um, can you handle if we play something from the new record for you now? Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Take a listen to this. That is Kings of Leon with The Bandit from their new record, When You See Yourself. Tell me a little bit about that song. Uh, that song is, um, I've always loved Westerns. That was something I used to watch when I was a kid. Um, and one of my favorite songwriters is uh, Towns Van Zant, And so it was a little bit of a nod to Poncho and Lefty kind of vibe. But I wanted to write it about... Um, this relationship between, you know, the bandit and the man who's, you know, hunting him down. And uh, it's really just about how their lives wouldn't be the same without one another. So it's kind of a little bit of a cat and mouse, but they're not really trying to, he's not really trying to catch the guy because, you know, the chase is what his life has become. And so in a way there's a respect between the bad guy and the good guy and they kind of know, like, I'm going to keep running. You're going to keep chasing me. And this is our, you know, this is what our life is going to be for the rest of, you know, rest of it, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's very, that's very Towns-ish, isn't it? I mean, I wish. I mean, I'll never be Towns Van Zandt, but I can at least uh, be inspired by what he's done. I love that line he said, I think it was in Heartworn Highways. He, he was about to play Poncho and Lefty, and he said, uh, this is a song I wrote about something I saw on the news two weeks later. Wow. <laughs> it's deep. It's deep. How do you find writing um, fictional sort of characters as opposed to writing from, from your own vantage point? Uh, it, I mean, I've, I've done it in the past a little bit, but I really, I really dug into it on this one. Um, because I find it's a, it's something that keeps me interested as the songwriter, you know, I'm, I'm looking at someone else as opposed to, you know, looking at myself and during that process, I feel like it actually allows me to tell a little bit of my own story, you know, veins of it throughout the album and never feel like I'm, uh, you know, preaching to the world and telling them my sob story or, you know, whatever. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's something that I'd, I'd try when I was a young songwriter, when I moved to Nashville, um, you know, we didn't have a record deal or anything like that. We, we didn't even know what we were, who we were, but I knew I, I was inspired by songwriters and I wanted to be a songwriter. And so I would go and park my car in a, in a parking lot of a grocery store and I would watch people come out of the grocery store and I'd be like, all right, you got two minutes to figure out what their whole situation is. And I would sit there and write about this old couple that was walking out of a thing and their love and their, I would try to tell their whole life story, you know, with however much time I could uh, witness it. And that's something that uh, has always stuck with me. It's like, you know, if I was writing a song about you, um, I would feel a lot more freedom to, you know, get a little wacky with it and tell your story. And, and in the meantime, you know, I feel like, after the fact, I feel like I can hear a, me being a little more personal in the songs, um, even if it's just one line at a time. I understand what you mean because I was thinking about you in the you know in the supermarket supermarket parking lot watching someone come out and creating a story about them. And and a the first thing I thought was that takes a lot of like compassion, a lot of empathy to feel like you you want to know them at all that you you feel something for them. You know what I mean? But it also tells me that because you can't possibly know them, you have to fill in the blanks with your own self yeah you, you know what i mean yeah i feel like it um you know it just gives you an opportunity to like i say you know tell a story that isn't about you but maybe in a way you're fantasizing about you know that that's you you're the you're one of the people in that couple that have been together for 50 years and you know have grandkids or whatever it is um yeah, just it just gives you a chance to kind of open up a little more and be a little more creative. And nobody wants to hear me sing about, you know, you know, woe is me. I mean, I've 
I've got a beautiful family. I'm healthy and happy. And, you know, so I don't really have a lot to complain about. Um, but if I'm talking about someone else, I can complain through them, I guess. Are you the, are you the good guy or the bad guy in that song? You think then? I think I'm both a little bit of both. Um, I'm probably more the bad guy, actually. I don't know. I, I, I don't see myself being the, the savior um, in the story, but I do see myself being the, the guy that's always looking out the window, seeing if someone's coming for him. My whole life, you know, we grew up on the road, our dad being a minister, and we didn't have television. We lived out of our car pretty much. But the window, that was my television. And traveling through the South and traveling, you know, all across America, I would look and I would study uh, people and different places. And that was something that, you know, was always in me and something that made me creative, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I always like to observe other people and, and yeah, try, try to try to throw myself into that situation because I've been, we've had a lot of situations in our life. You know, we were very poor growing up. Yeah. Um, now I'm not very poor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen everything in between, you know, so I, I feel like I, I can relate to a lot of people on a lot of different levels. Um, and yeah, that's, that's how I just try to tell my story. Let's, let, let's listen to another song. I want to keep talking about this. Take a listen. Miles away from places you have been Come with me To pull the shade Start of something new Nothing makes me feel the way You do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do. I'm Tom Power. You're listening to Q. Caleb Followville, Kings of Leon, is my guest. We're talking about their new album, When You See Yourself. You're hearing 100,000 people. 100,000 people, 100,000 people, which do you say? Uh, I just called 100,000. 100,000 people. But it, it was initially called 100,000 people in the old folks' home. Um, and then we scaled it down to 100,000 people. But oddly enough, you know, that was also something that was kind of prophetic in a way about the thing. Because when all the started to hit the fan, it was a lot of it was happening in old folks' homes. Um, I know that's probably not politically correct to call it that. No, uh, it's, it's, it's very true. Uh, old folks' homes, long tier, long, I think we call them here in Canada, we call them long term care facilities. Right. Yeah. And so that was something that we looked back and we're like, whoa, man. I mean, we had changed the, the title, but it was, it was one of those things where we're like, wow, that, that hit home pretty quick. Tell me, tell me about the song. So the song is. Um, I would say it's the most personal on the album because I, you know, my, my father-in-law, um, passed away. I think it's, it's been a few years now. It doesn't seem like it's been that long, but he had, uh, dementia, um, or Alzheimer's. I, I don't really know the difference in the two, but, um, I witnessed that. I, I, you know, I could see him slowly drifting away um, mentally and physically. And, um, so I wanted to write a song about that, you know? And so in the story, you know, it's, it's, it's a man who's, you know, been in love with this woman forever and they, they have a life together. And I never really finalize in the song if she is still around or if she isn't, it was just because I feel like that in his mind, he doesn't know if she's still around or she isn't. Um, he still looks at the picture, um, by his bed and he still, he knows this woman. He doesn't know how he knows her, but he, there's a love, um, that, that you can't take away. And so he's, he's constantly reminded of, of this blurred image of this woman that, you know, made him the man that he is. It's, um, scary. Yeah. Yeah, I don't wish it on anyone. I mean, he designed the White Album for the Beatles. He designed, he was a great artist. What? Yeah, yeah, he was a badass. Um, Captain Fantastic, Elton John. He did, he wrote books. He did, you know, he was a, he had a brilliant brain. Um, and he worked 
his whole life up until the end, you know, and even if you see like his drawings, the way they ended up in the end, his drawing, like the, the man could paint such a beautiful picture. And then by the end of it, you could see it just slowly starting to fade away. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was sad. He must've loved you. He did. He actually, I think that's why my wife is still with me because he loved me so much. He grew up in rock and roll. Um, you know, he was best friends with John Lennon and stuff like that. So when he saw me come into the picture, he was very excited that, uh, that, you know, I, I had knowledge of his work and also like he would, he would like quiz me on songs and I would always get it. And he was like, all right, this guy's all right. He knows his stuff. What's the, what's that like? I mean, I remember when I started doing this job, I started going to all of these sort of arts functions, you know what I mean? For the arts, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Yeah. And then I came from my parents were teachers. My dad was involved in, in labor and my mom's a teacher, you know? So, I mean, I never had a whole lot of experience with that. And I would go into these rooms and I would go, Oh my God, I don't know how, what, you know, like, what am I doing here? And I can only imagine if you're, you know, the child of a minister, you know, traveling and you'd, like you said, pretty poor. And all of a sudden you're in rooms with people who know John Lennon and all that. It must've been a bit, a bit shocking for you, you know? Yeah, it still is. I, I, I still find myself in rooms with people who are, very accomplished in different, you know, walks of life. And I'm always scratching my head, like, how the hell did I get here? Um, But they, you know, they seem to realize when someone is, I don't want to say good, but someone that works hard at what they do. And they, they see that in me, which is, which is flattering. Um, But yeah, many, many a times I, I end up just looking in the mirror in the bathroom at some party and going like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> I know. I know. What do, what do I possibly have to talk about with these people, you know? Exactly. Do they want to know about Wendy's? Um, how, how are you getting along with everybody in the band? I, I read um, a quote from you that said, I feel like we're in a place that it's taken us eight albums to get to. What, what place is that? Um, I mean, like I said before, I feel like, this was the one of the first times that we've gone into the studio to make an album where we were all on similar pages. You know, a lot of times each band members bringing their own inspiration. Jared listens to everything that's current to try to keep his finger on the pulse while at the same time, you know, making sure that it's as good as the classics. Um, Matthew, has a different inspiration every week. Um, his was photography on this one. So to get him to play the guitar was pretty, pretty difficult. <laughs> um, and Nathan's just back there blowing bubbles, having a good time. So, um, how about you? Yeah. I, I, me, I worked my, I worked my butt off on this one. I, I mean, everyone did, but I had to take my work home with me every night. Um, I'd be, First one at the studio writing, last one to leave, and and just the the work was never finished until the very last second. Um, I mean, we had recorded everything, and there were no vocals. And they kept saying like, "Well, when are you going to go do the vocal?" When are you? And I'm like, "Well, the song's not right." And so, I, a lot of these songs, I bet you, I wrote them six or seven different ways. I had I. I by the end of the record, I had five songbooks going. Um, and then I'd write something, I'd be like, oh, that's brilliant. And then I'd go in there and sing it and be like, oh, it doesn't sing at all. So I'd have to simplify it um, for the sake of the song. And it actually, you know, it, it made the songs better, I think. You know, sometimes you overthink things. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we're working with Marcus Drafts. He's a, he's a, man amongst boys you know he's, he's great at what he does and he never lets you um settle you know it's like just when you think something's great he's like oh maybe maybe this slow song should be a fast song and so that's what leads to as opposed to having two verses i would write four verses yeah. because it's a fast song now you know and we have to fill the time but yeah it was you know we worked really hard and we had a good time doing it and due to everything slowing down and stopping, actually, um, I feel like 
with the uncertainty of tours and things like that, we're all texting each other going like, should we just go make another record yeah. while we're waiting? Yeah. And then I was like, I don't know, man. I lost a lot of hair on the last one. Well, this gray beard happened overnight. So, right. I was curious about this, and I, I won't play it for you, but I was, I, I, I was getting ready to talk to you, and I put on a bunch of your music, and I put on the new record, and of course, the, you know, one of the big hits comes on, the Sex on Fire song comes mm-hmm. on. And when you have such a massive song like that, you know, sort of a, a international hit, and you, you, I, I, I want to be clear, you had had success before that, but when a song gets that kind of big, what changes for you as a songwriter? Anything? Uh, or just you? Yeah. Just anything change at all? Well, you have the pressure of recreating that that magic that happens when you have a hit song. And then if you're someone like me, who's, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like I, the success of it scared me and pushed me a little further into the corner. Um, you know, when, when everyone knows your song and, and it wasn't just knows your song, everyone knew us as sex on fire band, Yeah. you know, yeah. like they don't say like, uh, Kings of Leon from Tennessee, they're like, oh, you did Sex on Fire, right? Yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, at first it's a little scary. And then I feel like after a few years, you start to be kind of proud of yourself for that. Um, you know, that's something that not many people ever have in their life, you know? Doesn't matter what country we're in, um, where we are in the world, if we start Sex on Fire, there's a good chance that everyone's going to know the song. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it, you try to not force yourself to recreate that moment because I think I heard uh, Rivers Cuomo one time say, uh, he said, I know how to write hit pop songs. He's like, I know the formula. Um And you do, in a way, know the formula, but you also, you know, you're trying to grow and you're trying to do different things and you're trying to um, accomplish things that you haven't in your career. Um, And a hit is something that we have, we have accomplished that a couple of times, um, two times. (laughs) But it sounds like, (laughs) it sounds like, but I wasn't counting. It sounds like the weight is off, you know. I feel like at this point, people, they have to kind of credit us for being a band that's, you know, that's been around for a long time now, almost 20 years. Um, It doesn't feel like it's been 20 years, but it's been 20 years. So, you know, the fact that we're still doing it and we're still doing it on a level that, you know, a lot of people would like to be doing it is, uh, there's a reason to be proud of that. And, uh, and I hope. You know, my kids are proud of me for what we've accomplished. I wasn't expecting to talk to you about this when I, you know, I knew the record was coming out and, and I was all excited to talk to you and about music and all that. I, I didn't expect any of this, which is the the NFT thing. So uh, let, let me explain this to people. So there's a companion to When You See Yourself called NFT Yourself. It includes exclusive digital art, vinyl, sort of one-of-a-kind experiences. You purchase this with NFTs, which is a type of cryptocurrency. Instead of holding money, you hold assets like art. What what appealed to you about that? I'm still kind of wrapping my head around this thing. What what appealed to you uh, about this? Uh, I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it as well. <laughs> um, I feel like we just had an opportunity to uh, to kind of take it back to the old school ways of go into a, you know, you go to a record store and you, you have your vinyl or your CD or whatever it is. And you go home and you open it and you read the lyrics and you look at all the artwork, everything that's come into play. Speaking of my father-in-law, that kind of thing, you know, his, his art was worth something, you know? Um, And so we've have tried to find a way to where our fans can feel like they own something and it's just theirs and no one else has it. Um, and I mean, you know, it's not a money grab situation because we, we found an opportunity to give more money back to the, we have a thing called crew nation that we work with. So a lot of our merchandise 
all the proceeds go to Crew Nation. A lot of these NFTs, all of it goes to Crew Nation. And that's just to support crew members that have been off the road and not able to work for the last year. Uh, they're the ones that, you know, make our world go round. Everyone <clears throat> sees four guys up on stage and they think that <clears throat> it's like something that we have created ourselves, but there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of people that have been with us from day one. It's a family. Uh, yeah. I mean, it literally is. Our cousin Nacho is our, you know, he's a guitar tech. Um, our cousin Jared was our security guard. So it just gives us a way to give back. And I, I can't sit here and tell you exactly what the hell the NFT is because <laughs> I still don't know. Um, but, but I, I, you know, we found a way to kind of capitalize on something. And, and you know, it has people talking. And now a lot of people are involved in that game. I, I like it. Maybe I shouldn't say I like it because I think I'm supposed to sound impartial here. What I find interesting about it is that it's a sort of a course correction for a time when musicians are talking about the value of their art now that everything is streamed, you know? That's what I find interesting about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the record industry has been, it's been flawed for a long time and I'm on a record label, so I don't want to go, <laughs> I don't want to go too crazy. I, I can see a laser to, coming on your. <laughs> I want to make sure they've pushed this album before, uh, before they kick us to the curb, but um, <laughs> Yeah, man. I, you know, back in the day, it was somewhat of a mafia, the way they ran things and they dangle a carrot in your face um, and make you think that, you know, the reason you have your job is because they uh, plucked you out of obscurity and um, made you something when really, you know, the artist is the one that's holding the key. I mean, they're the ones that are creating. They're the ones that are doing all the work. Um, so yeah, it's it, it. You know, obviously, I think the record industry has a long way to go. Um, but whatever we can do to kind of nudge them in the right direction, that's what we're going to try to do. And I'm sure a lot of people weren't that excited when we did the NFT thing because I think a lot of record labels were scrambling, going like, "What the hell is this? How how do they do this? How did they do this without anyone knowing? Uh, how did they? How were they informed that this was something that could be done?" But we, you know, we kind of snuck in there and did something that they got people talking. It, it really did. It's been nice talking to you. Um, I, I, want, I want to close like this because I think I've been reflecting a lot about what happens when you, not just what happens when you write a big hit, but I've been reflecting a lot about you as a songwriter and you telling me that, the, you know, I still can't get over that story about you sitting in the parking lot and, and watching people, you know, and really giving great attention to the craft. So what has the pandemic year been for you in terms of writing? Do you think it's changed you at all in terms of your writing? Well, I, I was happy that we had completed the album because the pressure, and I, I think we'll be able to tell soon, whatever music is coming out, I think there a lot of artists are going to feel pressured to, uh, to talk about current things that are, that are happening and, and that's a lot of pressure to put on yeah. someone. Um, I was very happy to not have a microphone in my hand. I was uh, very happy to, not happy, but, you know, to sit back and kind of watch things and let it really sink in and not not try to write a song really quick about something. And, you know, and you don't really know everything yet. And it comes off a little tone deaf or something. Or, or dishonest. Um, yeah, exactly. Or forced. You know, you don't want to force force your opinion on the world when God knows everybody has an opinion. I don't like most of them. I think yeah. I said that in the record. <laughs> well, listen, it's, it's a great record and I love talking to you about it. Thank you very much. It's been a, been a thrill to talk to you.